you to our show sponsors, Acadian Plant Health, Corteva and List D3, and Adama Canada. While other sources of innovation run dry and fail to understand your needs, Adama is here to deliver. And we're all in on you. Talk to your Adama sales rep today. <laughs> Good evening, everyone. Welcome to The Agronomist. I am your host, Lindsay Smith. And uh, I am pretty darn excited for tonight's topic. But of course, before we get there, a quick reminder, if you uh, collect those CEU credits, head on over to realagriculture.com slash agronomist. Let us know you caught the program and we'll get those up for you. And tonight's show does qualify as a knowledge sharing event. For those of you in Ontario who uh, were successful in getting some off calf funding, tonight's broadcast also uh, will qualify you as a knowledge sharing event. Details for that will be a little later in the show. We've got an email address for you to zip your info to. We may see if we can share the form, but it doesn't always work. So we'll just do email because that always works. Mm-hmm. All right. N- tonight, uh, you might have noticed that Ray did not say good evening in the chat. And that's because we have him here as a guest. So we'll bring in our guest for tonight's discussion on nitrogen management and enhanced efficiency fertilizers. We've got Mario Tenuta with the University of Manitoba. Ray DeBiker, as promised independent agronomist from Calgary, and Dale Cowan with Agris Co-op here in Ontario. Welcome, gentlemen. Nice to be here. Thank you. Good Good evening, Lindsay. Hello. And um, (laughs) Tammy says that she's worried the chat will be quiet since the legend Ray DeBenko is on screen. It's okay. He'll just talk on screen, Tammy. It's fine. Everything's fine. And he's not yellow this time, everybody. We fixed the light issue. So there you go. All right. So we've got we've got a Manitoba, Alberta, Ontario uh, represented here. So this should get us, we hope, a pretty uh, <clears throat> wide swath of questions and answers on nitrogen management. Uh, Mario, I'll start with you. Let's start with perhaps trying to put some parameters on the scope of what we're talking about. Um, nitrogen loss, at least for where you do most of your research, of course, in Manitoba, the scope and scale of that, why do we talk about this over and over? Uh, well, because of the, the dollars um, that um, are lost in terms of nitrogen and um, because we compensate often for that nitrogen loss with more fertilizer. And so that just puts a lot of pressure, pressure on the pocketbook, pressure on time, pressure on the environment. And so, Reducing losses is, is um, and basically, and there there are many benefits mm-hmm. to that. So that that's the bottom line, is, which is why I think we're here today. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Now, we're going to talk about enhanced efficiency fertilizers, but not only enhanced efficiency fertilizers, because of course we know that there are several ways that we lose nitrogen. There are several ways that we can manage those losses that aren't necessarily product related. So uh, by all means, bring in those questions for those as well. And we're going to talk about some of those tonight. Ray, tell us a bit about, uh, you're an independent agronomist. You're apparently retired, but I don't accept that entirely. Um, For most of your career though, this was, you know, nutrient management was your bread and butter. How important is the question of nitrogen, of managing nitrogen losses on the grand scheme of things? Well, thanks, Lindsay. It was a big part. And Mario was a big part with the research that he uh, conducted for us. That's much appreciated. Uh, like Mario said, it's, it's about dollars. <clears throat> but I think I start with looking at, you know, what forms of loss are prevalent in the farm and then what products are going to fit to preclude or reduce those losses so we have to i think first understand where the losses are coming from or what mechanism is producing the loss and then if there a product enhanced efficiency fertilizer that can can help us but it's not a you know it's not an excuse for bad management you alluded to that earlier better management practices i think are the are the low-hanging fruit things we need to address first and then based on the farm operation, there are products that we can slot in to reduce those losses. And Dale's probably going to talk about, you know, what the return is and how we manage the dollars in and the dollars out. Well, that's an excellent segue, Dale, except for that, for at least this year, you're still waiting to take some of the most relevant plots (laughs) off, which we laugh, but it's not funny. So Dale, tell us what what trials are in the field uh, that still are in the field. 
Well, we, we, we implemented some delta yield check scripts, which means taking blocks through the field of a very low rate, like say nothing more than 40 pounds, and then a strip of really ridiculous tie rate, like 260 actual ends. So we have a non-limiting rate and that yield, delta yield between those two rates gives us some idea of what the optimum rate of nitrogen would have been. Now that's, that's a bit of a rear view mirror look, but what we've been finding over time that consistent production systems on fields tend to make a very narrow range for optimum end rate. So it's one way to get at your optimum end rate, which we're always debating how much end to put on. And we're always questioning, do we have a end demand problem or end supply problem during the season? So we're looking at tools to help uh, assess that. And then I got uh, some, some nitrogen concept management trials where we're looking at uh, uh, like an ESN type product mixed with urea, looking at straight urea with Anvil uh, urease inhibitor, and then another competing product with that, and then straight urea replicated in the field. So uh, we did some initial plant tissue work uh, at the ear leaf, and there was a phenomenal difference. I think the ESN was 3.8% nitrogen, the straight urea was 1.76% nitrogen. So I'm anticipating some pretty big yield differences when we actually do get to harvest. So I'm anxious. So it's kind of an apples and orange comparison, but I'm more interested in emulating what farmers want to do on their field. So some want right. ESN, some want to use Anvil. And so I just concentrate on, on the dry product, but uh, we've done other trials in the past. We, we are predominantly a UAN side dress market. So right off the bat, most of our farmers leave their nitrogen in the tank for 60 days. So we've already got a pretty good efficiency thing going with side dress nitrogen. Mm -hmm. Dale, just quickly, um, when do you perhaps hope those plots will be harvested, given the weather happening right now? A end of the week, I was told. So. Oh, you were told. Let's yeah. hope. Okay, well, everyone think very warm, dry thoughts for Dale's area of Ontario. Um, certainly not alone in still having crop out for sure. Uh, it has been a challenging corn harvest, that's for sure. Uh, but we will keep tabs on that Dale as well. Um, Mario, in in hearing, yes, for Ontario, uh, for corn, we are predominantly, we're side dressing, we're pulling a nitrate soil test at that time. Um, I mean, I, there's already a lot of work that's going into trying to choose the right rate of nitrogen. Um, things are different in the west of course often fall applied happens then we've got a lot that goes on in the spring and yes we're seeing split up but when we talk management versus product is split application like the first thing the first sort of management change you would make or are there others well it's interesting you say that so we've tried uh, split application with potatoes corn and canola and um, of the practices uh, to reduce nitrous oxide, you know, that's one of my, my uh, favorite gases, mm -hmm. um, split application does a wonderful job in reducing nitrous oxide emissions because the, at spring planting is often in, in the West, it's usually the wettest period of the year. And we get the most uh, losses in terms of nitrous oxide at that time, and also you can get um, um, potential leaching losses if the if the soil is uh, saturated, and we get um, um, movement down and drainage. And so the split application does a wonderful job. Actually, our synthesis of like over twenty site years is replicated uh, trials on usually on farmer fields that it, that we work with with farmer land that we do our trials on. It was over 60% reduction in nitrous oxide emissions by going to split application when you when you uh, look at the data across potato, corn, and canola. Now, potato and corn, that is done mm -hmm. um, regularly for the potato. Uh, in corn, um, we it's popular in, in Manitoba. Um, and we do have um, uh, spring applied, and we do also have a fall applied. Uh, on corn in Manitoba. So it's quite the mix, a little different than uh, Ontario from that standpoint. But the split application, I find, is a great cultural practice that actually doesn't require um, a, uh, a product. Okay. And so, but the problem with the split application is that it's, uh, it's 
good for certain crops, the longer season crops mm -hmm. where the nitrogen uptake is later on in the seasons. But if you have something like uh, spring wheat, uh, barley, uh, you know, it, uh, the jury's out on that. But we are trying that with, with uh, even the cereals. And mm -hmm. just we're just looking at a two to three week delay that that we've got to narrow that window. It's not like corn. OK, right. Um, so yeah. um, and uh, we'll even see if there's a benefit there. I think there will be because the soil moisture will be lower at generally lower at that time of the split. Right. And, and that is one of the challenges in the West is exactly that the nitrogen demand is so early for some of these crops and just the growing season is that much shorter that a split is still potentially is not very far apart um, if we're trying to also optimize for the plant which that creates yeah. a bit of a headache well the big danger with the split in in the west in particular where you get in more arid uh, zones is you can just strain the nitrogen at the surface and it's not getting pushed down into the root system so that's that's the issue. So if you really delay that split, it becomes more and more a risk to uh, mm -hmm. hanging the nitrogen at the surface. Now, Ray, we've got a, a question here about leaching in Western Canada. So to review, there is not a hundred ways we use we lose nitrogen. There's only actually a few, but leaching is one of them. So it does nitrogen moves with water. It can go through the soil profile and away she goes. Um, you though ray do you know what soil moisture is up? anymore no we're still okay is ray frozen maybe we'll pause ray are you there oh well, there he goes well he's not yellow but he's frozen he may have to go and come back mm -hmm. yes so to me, it's, well, to me it sounds yeah. great this is like <laughs> Mario, that's not nice. Um, we should probably mention a bunch of the guy when he's down, aren't we? <laughs> yeah, these gents go way back. They're, this is probably going to happen. Um, okay, we'll wait for Ray to unfreeze. Um, and a mention of leaching in Western Canada. What percentage of arable land would actually be at high risk? So this is that is for Western Canada. But I want to just pause on that for a moment, Curtis. We will answer that. But Dale, when we think about the Ontario situation because this is a question we get sometimes with tile drainage and nutrients moving with water and those sorts of things how big of a risk is leaching for nitrogen ray we're going to get back to you in a moment you're back i'm pretty sure very i missed glad. a lot of important things yeah <laughs> so just pause dale's going to answer and then i'm going back to you okay but please don't don't freeze again well, our, our nitrogen loss very much depends on our soil texture. So on sandy soils, it's, it is a high risk, but it's going to be dependent on how much rainfall you get. And it does take quite a bit of rainfall for leaching to really move out of the root zone. Technically, any nitrogen in the top 24 inches is still available for a corn crop. So it might move down a little bit further, but the corn crop will eventually get it. And it's going to take most of its end up after 60 days anyway. So, and then our bigger concern to me is our heavy clay soils denitrification on saturated soils. Yeah. So after, you know, 24 to 48 hours uh, saturated for a week, we can lose significant, maybe 35, 40% of our nitrogen be lost on our water log. So it depends on our, our soil texture as to what, how you want to answer that question. But it's uh, mm -hmm. this summer in particular, we had some fields get 40 inches rain after planting. So we had tremendous nitrogen loss, but we also lost yield potential because it was just too wet, just too much water. So, yeah. So Ray, we'll go back to you. This is something that you probably haven't seen a lot of in areas that you worked and Southern Alberta, where you hang out every once in a while, uh, the too much water question. Um, but so leaching in Western Canada, there, there obviously are going to be soils that are sandy that would be at risk to leaching losses, but how big of a risk, generally speaking, would leaching be in Western Canada? I think it really depends, as Dale said, on the soil texture. And Mario made a comment about, let's say, potatoes. If you're in the Carberry area on a very sandy soil, an inch of rainfall can move the nitrate leaching front six to seven inches. If you're on a heavier clay soil like Dale talked about, we we're talking maybe one or two inches. It doesn't mean it's necessarily going to be flushed out of the root zone. It depends when that leaching event occurs. And it really is, I'm not going to use a depends word, Lindsay. I'm going to use situationally specific situationally oh. specific right, we did right have now. some slides on, on general leaching losses and things we're not going to go to those but you know zero to twenty percent 
it, it really it really does okay. depend on the soil texture like dale said it's it's probably not our primary loss mechanism in the prairies and mario said this it's more likely to be denitrification or nitrification denitrification that we have to worry about leaching mm -hmm. sandier textured soils in the irrigated areas more of a of a problem than i think anything else but it's it's not a big problem for us we don't have now, the moisture. right it, and well, or Muriel necessarily the soil. In. Muriel's got his hand up. Good. Okay. I was going to say, <laughs> Jay, producer Jay, we could go to slide five if of uh, Mario's slides, even though Ray says he doesn't want to go to his slides. We do have slides, everyone, that we can use. Um, and Mario, take her away with what you want to say, whether it is in regards to this or not. Oh, well, well, okay. Well, there we go. There's leaching. There you have it. There, there it is. Um, uh, and it, you know, everybody knows it's it's that nitrate, which is uh, not stuck to soil. And, it, and so it's not bound to clays or, or organic matter. And then as water moves uh, down, it goes. Um, I can't even read my own text there. It seems to be uh, so small there, but uh, it's, it's variable. Obviously, as we get uh, more humid uh, conditions, environments, then we have more leaching losses. Um, I always go to, uh, to the situation in the east, uh, there's little fall application and there's a little fall soil testing of nitrogen because you can't expect it to be there uh, in mm -hmm. the spring, right? And that's partly due to leaching, partly due to denitrification. In the West, we do do um, fall application. It's not, not the majority, but it is done, especially with anhydrous ammonia. And then um, it, we do a fall soil test. Now, the fall soil tests generally are useful in the springtime. In some years, they're not. In some years, producers will actually go out there and resample again in the spring because they're, they know to not trust their um, uh, fall soil tests because it was a wet fall, a delayed planting, or a delayed spring, and there's moisture, big snowpack, and so forth like that. So we know there is leaching occurring um in the west it just doesn't happen every year i go back to uh, some research that gary kachanowski um did uh, so he was a um, soil scientist and uh when he was at university of alberta there were some plots that were uh, research plots that were put down and there was um, a tracer a salt tracer placed in the ground I, I, I forget if it was chloride or if it was bromide but he was showing that uh once every four once every five year years the salt was moving down um so in those years there was there was leaching occurring but but um i think we're, we're really emphasizing the leaching here but, you know for the west and it's it's really you know the ammonia volatilization losses that denitrification yep. losses those are probably going to be the, the more prone one but i've seen situations on potatoes for example where a producer has irrigated and then an unexpected thunderstorm has come in and they've no they know that they've lost a good amount of nitrogen uh, in the ground so it, it does happen in the west uh, but it's sporadic and um you know it's, it's a real bummer when you put your fertilizer down in the fall and um, it's been an extremely wet fall snowpack and delayed seeding um and so um and you can see that can find and see notice uh, the the loss in pounds of, of nitrogen mm -hmm. so okay so we do need to talk about leaching but now we're going to park it because i think we've covered it it is a risk <laughs> probably not it's probably not our biggest risk but i think it's important to mention it also i will point out um is that sweet corn mario i don't know what is on that slide because it's popcorn, Damn, <laughs> you're, it's popcorn? is that what it is okay like i was just wondering yeah, okay, it's popcorn. There you go. Let's go with that. All right. Um, <laughs> Jay, let's let's switch gears. Uh, I think, Ray, it's your slide number three. Um, this, we're going to shift gears to talk about, so why enhanced efficiency nitrogen? And here are our categories. Because I think this is where, and I want to go through this a little bit, I think this is still where we get some, um, we have to remember which is which, which one does which, and then, of course, the names of them when they're in the market. And, and Dale, you've done a good job of outlining some of the ones that you're comparing. Um, so 
there's a few things we have to learn here, which is, you know, the nomenclature of what they are. And then, of course, they have trade names. So um, what you're asking for uh, at the retail um, is going to be one of these two. Uh, so, Ray, I'll maybe pass it to you here. This is your slide. So sure. um, I'm, I'm going to leave out the trade names since that's like five years sure. in my past. And Dale okay. and Mariel can cover this. <clears throat> but yes, it, you know, the umbrella picture is slow and controlled release and inhibitors or stabilizers. And I made the comment earlier about understanding what loss mechanism you're trying to protect against. And that's where the products fit in. If, as Mario said, it's volatile loss from surface supplied unincorporated urea, you're looking at a urease inhibitor. If you're looking at keeping it in the ammonium form to resist against leaching or perhaps denitrification, as, as Dale had said, a nitrification inhibitor or a combination of dual inhibitor that does both. Controlled release um, depends <clears throat> on you know the situation. If you want slow controlled release over the growing season and the environment that you're going to place it in, so they all have their fit, and they all have their you know their pros and their cons, and it really depends on what you're trying to accomplish. There's tools there, but again, as I said earlier, they're not excuses. So a lot of different products, different modes of action, and I think people have to understand what it is they're trying to you know protect against because so often somebody walks into a retail as you said Lindsay and says give me an enhanced efficiency fertilizer but they really don't understand <clears throat> what they're trying to solve and they're just going to waste their money and that's really the biggest disservice to enhanced efficiency fertilizers is farmers or their agronomists don't really understand what they're trying to accomplish and don't pick the right product. Mm -hmm. Um, and so that is one of the, that's bang on what I want to talk about tonight. Uh, but Tammy would like to point out that the name at the bottom of your slide, Ray, um, the acronym is absolutely not a word. And so you're going to have to redo that entirely. Where is she looking at this? <laughs> the bottom of the Pragmatic and Innovative Soil Fertility and Crop Nutrition Council. Um, you're oh. going to have to work on your acronym. It, it doesn't say anything. So we I'll work on that later. <laughs> we'll help you out with that one later. Um, so we got to work on that. One. Okay. <clears throat> So, so on that note, exactly that, Ray, and that's the crux of what I, what I want to talk about tonight is, is I think most of us know why we want to protect our nitrogen and the, the scale of which, but it's the how and when that's a slam dunk and other things maybe we need to worry about. So that exactly that as agronomists, uh, we're asking for the right things or recommending the right products, um, but also as farmers that we're, we're cognizant of which losses are the most uh, likely and, and the products we need to potentially mitigate that. Um, so we'll dig into that in just a moment. Producer Jay, if you could, uh, we'll hear our second uh, show sponsor tonight, and then we'll get back into this conversation. The Agronomist is brought to you by Adama Canada, Acadian Plant Health, and Enlist E3 from Corteva. Looking for high yields and clean fields? Choose Enlist E3 Soybeans, part of the Enlist Weed Control System. Enlist E3 Soybeans help you control tough weeds, providing herbicide choice and tank mix flexibility. Enlist E3 Soybeans, the best in beans, period. Gonna get down. Um, there is a clip I have a little later that I am gonna going to play um, with Brian Barris out of Alberta, and I did want to note just this week um, we've got some a new research paper that just came out comparing enhanced efficiency fertilizers uh, in the West. So, um, but that's uh, we'll throw to that a little a little later. Um, I think we're gonna go uh, producer Jay slide seven of Mr. Or, sorry, Dr. Mario Tenuta's work. Slide seven, here we go. All right, we are getting into the trade names, everybody, because this is pretty important um, in that you need to be asking for the right thing. So, Mary, I'll throw to you on this one. Um, how, is there still confusion between these? Because I feel like there is. Well, look at that slide. Yeah. <laughs> that's, that's confusion yeah. just written all over it, isn't it? That's what I'm there's, saying. There's so so many products and so many uh, names and logos, um, and it's so it's to be honest, it's it's tough to to wade through. You have to be be careful. You know, it's, it's basically like other products, uh, herbicides and so forth. Okay. Um, they have their use, uh, and uh, you need to use them um, according to the label or, or their their right purpose, the situation. And, um, and I'll give you an example, the urease inhibitors, those are products that 
just have uh, an inhibitor of a, of a natural enzyme in soil that prevents the transformation of urea to liberate uh, ammonia and ammonium. And so it protects that. Now, when would somebody want to use that product? Well, when your fertilizer contains urea. Then secondly, when your fertilizer is prone to ammonia volatilization losses. So that means when the urea is at the surface of the soil, left at the surface of the soil. That's when you would use a product like that. Now, the nitrification inhibitor is um, uh, also targets enzymes in nitrifying bacteria. And in the, the net result is slowing down by two, maybe three weeks of the appearance of nitrate from the ammonia ammonium form from fertilizer. Now, nitrification inhibitors are probably best used subsurface when the nitrogen uh, is in the, the soil, okay? And then now there's the, the product that most people are actually familiar with, uh, which are the double inhibitors, okay? Just because they've been kind of, maybe pe people say, well, this covers me for, for you know, multiple uh, uh, loss pathways, containing a urease and identification inhibitor. Now we find from our research that for preventing the uh, ammonia losses, a double inhibitor is not as good as a urease inhibitor because the nitrification actually blocks the, uh, it builds up the ammonia a little bit more. And so uh, it's not quite as good as a urease inhibitor if you leave your nitrogen at the surface. It does have a benefit of reducing nitrous oxide emissions though, if it's, if it's uh, the nitrogen's even at the surface. So there's mm -hmm. a so the the night the double inhibitor is where most of the attention's at. I would prefer if the attention was more in the single uh, inhibitors, and we paid attention to the situation that they're needed to be used in. And here we're really talking about uh, the placement, so where they are relative to the surface, and um, then what's 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 the the target for the protection. So. With the nitrification inhibitors, it's it's about a two to three three week window that we're looking at for for protection there. Uh, the urease inhibitors, they also have a, a fine a finite uh, time, and that they're um, effective after two or three weeks. They will um, not be uh, functional. So in the prairies, where it's been uh, some cases where it's dry, the urea fertilizer will be placed on the surface with an inhibitor, but um, over time, the inhibitor will, will break down due to UV light and so forth. And then by the time you get some rain, um, you mm -hmm. still can get ammonia volatilization mm -hmm. losses. So, so we, you know, we have to know about these products. And what leads to great confusion is that there's several different active ingredients that right. for these targeting these enzymes. And not only that, they, they come in different concentrations. Right. Yeah. It's just trying to make it easy. Okay, so, so Dale, exactly that, what, you know, Certainly, a lot of the focus is on corn. It is on the split app. Uh, but do you follow Mario's thinking on the double inhibitor, or are there certain classes that you really are tending towards because that is really the main focus of what your growers are going to need? <clears throat> well, to, to add a further wrinkle, so yeah, I, I agree in principle with what Mario said. I don't agree with any of it. It's uh, <clears throat> for those customers who want to put urea on broadcast say on winter wheat uh, and it happens to be kind of a dry forecast coming we we would recommend anvil to reduce the uh, volatilization loss or use act, enzyme activity on winter wheat because usually there's lots of surface trash and you got uh, green material there so you can drive more uh urease activity with trash on the surface so especially if you no-till your wheat in a soybean stubble so we do recommend that aspect. You made a good point when I brought up all these products have labels and on the label, they give you the concentration. And so they have different price points. So, you know, uh, I think uh, again, to some of the Tribune down there later in the doubles, it has 13.85% DCD equivalent. Well, there's others on the market that have half that and different price point. And then some will say, well, dial in your protection. You want seven day protection, 14 day protection, or 20 day protection. Here's, here's our suite of products. I don't know how many farmers say, well, I only want seven days. So uh, mm -hmm. it gets further complicated by, by the concentrations. But anyways, it's just uh, working with your trust advisor, knowing what you want to do. For us, uh, we use a lot of Tribune because we do a lot of UAN. 
And when we talk about side dress, you get the idea that we're putting it in the ground. Seldom do we get it much more than an inch deep. When you have a concentrated band, you actually get more polarization loss. So that's why we like to use the dual inhibitor there. Normally, if you get at least a half inch of rain when you're done, you don't need to worry about any of the nitrogen loss. So these mm -hmm. inhibitors work really well when you have situations that promote loss. So some years we use these products, we get a half inch rain right after application somewhat negates uh, some of the utilization loss, still helps with the nitrification inhibitor down the road, especially if it's there for two or three weeks. So, yeah, so it's, it's just uh, knowing what, uh, what the farmer's practice is. Uh, I think we do a pretty good job of, of, of explaining what the roles are. It's uh, when some of the entrench products came out, everybody thought they were all the same, right? Mm -hmm. So they're not all the same. So uh, they're quite quite different in what they do and how they work. So it's uh, worthwhile g getting a label, talking to someone that uh, in the industry that's used to using these products and, and get them situated uh, in the right place at the right time. So, and Dale, you bring up a good point that, you know, these are risk management tools. And right. so in certain situations, if conditions are such that that risk isn't necessarily there, then they're not necessarily going to add a benefit but just like any other risk management, it's the, in case it happens. Yes, well, Ray, that was, that I was going I'm to I'm just going to hijack on Dale here for a second about, okay, the risk at the time, but then you have to look at the engaging environment and what is the risk in the future. In Dale's situation, I, I think compared to where Mary, when I live, the risk for him is almost continuously high. For us, mm -hmm. it's more episodic or transient, or we are hoping it's going to get wet. Yeah. Whereas Dale's hoping it's not going to be as wet as it has been. So, yeah. you know, right. I'm not going to put words, <laughs> Dale's going to have his chance here, but I'm just thinking if I lived where Dale did and had the clientele, I'm more likely to be recommending enhanced efficiency fertilizers as a risk management, and it, it's going to be a win. Where Mary, when I live, I, I think it does become situationally specific and, and not as problematic as where Dale does. Anyway, sorry. Yep. Go ahead, Dale. Hey, hey, no, great points. Uh, well taken. Yeah, so we, we have a, farmers are great at producing a system that lets them plant their corn in a hurry, right? So some farmers prefer a very easy uh, broadcast, urea, work it in, plant my corn. And those customers, we tend to encourage uh, ESN because when you look at, you know, the first 45 to 50 days of corn growth, it only takes up 30 pounds of N. So the question is, why would you want to put out 175, 200 pounds of N 60 days before it's needed? If they want to farm that way, then we would really, and I agree with you, encourage the, the, the controlled release or polymer coated type products to get that 60, 90 day release window and reduce potential losses. And when we talk about risk from a farmer perspective, it's about money. It's about, I, I spent this money, I lost this much and I lost this much yield. And I'm sure Mario will jump in and say what we're concerned about going forward. And it's hard for people in my industry at what I do to measure nitrous oxide loss. So we count on researchers to tell us that we can also reduce our nitrous oxide emissions by 50% when we use these nitrous stabilizers. So, so the other aspect of risk is, is in this climate aspect and this greenhouse gas aspect. It's not just dollars and cents. So how we get there and how we make sense of that is yet to be determined. So. Mm, absolutely. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Jason Vogt out of Southern Manitoba. Some of you may know him. Uh, for Dale, what are most uh, growers banding side dress and for, for depth? So what is the average depth, would you say, for oh, side dress on corn? Is there such a thing? I, I would say I seldom see anyone at two inches deep. Seldom. Really? Yeah. Well, why would you do would primary you... tillage when you're side dressing your corn? Come on. Oh, you know, we're, we're, either, we're either in a no-till situation on some light ground right. or we're in a minimum till situation. So there's really no need. Okay. And depending on your herbicide program, you do a lot of soil disturbance. You're going to have a nice row of weeds where the nitrogen went in. So uh, yep. shallow is 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 really where, where, where we're going. And, and quite frankly, in some of the sandy ground, I don't know that we want to bury it four or five inches deep. It'll right. get there soon enough in our area with, with the rainfall yeah. we typically get. So, yeah, so it's not a very deep thing. And then some of the side dressers are simply a colder with a high pressure nozzle, and hopefully the nozzle is hitting the slot, 
right, than getting in the ground. So there's some aspects of that too. I don't. So. I don't know that. Hopefully, is a word I want in that sentence, Dale. I'll be honest. Would I would like more precision. Off the coulter is that is that the other option? <laughs> it bounces yeah. off. Yeesh. Now, okay, but Mario, if if we are looking in more of a Western scenario, we always talk about you know that it needs to be deeper than that. So why is that? Well, um, <laughs> so um, in, in the prairies, banding nitrogen is the majority, right? Mm -hmm. And a lot of the prairies, uh, again, probably majority, uh, majority are um, one pass operations. So uh, we are looking at uh, the nitrogen and the seed going down at the same time. And the, the, the work done in the 80s um, by iCanada scientists, Cindy Grant comes to mind in particular, was showing that um, uh, side banding uh, and that greater than two inches, three inches around there, and some could be a little bit deeper. Um, but that was the, the de facto gold standard. Okay. Uh, it, now, over time, now I'm talking about a planting. Okay, not particularly mm -hmm. a, a side dress timing. Side dress timing is going to be a bit, a bit shallower than that. Um, mm -hmm. Is it with with corn? Um, and then, uh, but lately, it's becoming shallower and shallower, um, and uh, particularly to reduce fuel use, um, canola, small seeded canola, shallow seeded as well and therefore you don't want to um, uh, you bring your nitrogen fertilizer shallow as well um, and so um, we have a trend now where we are getting shallower okay in in the prairies and we've been looking at this and uh, for nitrogen losses because there was some work done in the east in quebec saying that shallow banding led to lots of ammonia loss at the surface we have not been able to find that in the prairies and sand soils, clay soils, uh, over numerous site years. So, but we have found, and I'm glad Dale mentioned nitrous oxide because it is going to be, you know, okay. I hate to say this, we're going to be farming for nitrous oxide or, mm -hmm. or, or the other way around, farming to prevent nitrous oxide emissions pretty soon. And, mm -hmm. um, that shallow banding uh, increases into emissions drastically that we've seen with canola. So it, we've, we, oh, go ahead. I was gonna say we lose more with shallow banding in terms of nitrous oxide than uh, broadcast at the surface, leaving it at the surface. Okay, yes, okay, Ray, go ahead. So I, I just wanted to address Jason's hands. question. Yeah, I, I just wanted to address Jason's votes question in the chat because Mario was commenting on this when Jason asked, what depth would you need to not use an EEF? Yes. I think the first question is, what are you trying to accomplish? So in the conversation we're having now, it's reducing volatile loss or volatilization. So as Mario said, two inches is kind of kind of it. But if you're looking, as Dale commented on, season-long rainfall, then maybe the dual inhibitor is going to fit. So that question is, if you're just trying to address volatile loss, two inches is probably going to do it. But if you're concerned about season-long rainfall, potential nitrous oxide emissions, then the dual inhibitor is probably going to be what you need to, to look at. So again, it's this understanding what loss you're trying to address, what product fits. So Mario, is it fair? Because we've talked about this, we've tackled this many times and we will continue to talk about this topic because we'll never cover everything in an hour. Um, but we've had the discussion of, you know, nitrous oxide emissions might not be the most costly of the emissions, but they are the most costly to the environment. Can you sort of put that into context first so we have that in this conversation? Yes. Uh, <laughs> so, as everybody knows, uh, there's um, a bit of a trend towards trying to reduce uh, greenhouse gas emissions in general. Um, nitrous oxide is, is um, uh, the biggest source is from nitrogen use in soils. And um, so for agriculture to reduce its contributions of greenhouse gases, targeting that reduction um mm -hmm. makes makes sense now however uh when you're losing one two we can get more than that i was looking at data today's 
seven pounds of nitrogen lost is N2O and then uh, just south of Winnipeg here. And, and that's fairly common in, in Southern Ontario as, as well can be. Um, but uh, ammonia losses can definitely be much more than that. Craig Jury and, um, and Harrow is showing, um, you know, tens of pounds potentially of nitrogen when, uh, uh, with uh, top dress of corn uh, when it's hot and windy. And uh, the nitrification and clay soils, waterlogged, you know, you're losing um, uh, could be 30, 40 percent of, of your nitrogen and so forth. Um, uh, over, so the nitrous oxide is completely about uh, the environment. Mm -hmm. um, now, it, it, there is a little bit of bleed over into agronomic nitrogen losses, for example, because leaching of nitrogen eventually produces some n2o at some point when it completes when the nitrate completes the the nitrogen cycle and also ammonia loss eventually produces a little bit of n2o emissions okay so what we do to re reduce n2o emissions we're actually um, target actually all the loss pathways so if we're reducing nit uh, nitrate leaching, we're reducing N2O emissions. You're reducing ammonia volatilization, you're reducing N2O emissions. If you target N2O emissions directly, you're reducing that, we're likely losing some other, uh, reducing the other losses as well, okay? So so there, there's benefits all around. It's just the, the tangibility in terms of yield is difficult. So on the prairies where we're, we're banding, soil testing, um, and we're using uh, ammoniacal sources of nitrogen generally, uh, and, and we don't have the uh, very humid conditions generally, uh, that we it's hard pressed to see that yield advantage because let's say it, our, our producers are already doing a, a decent job with their, their practices. So it begs the question then, well, how do you make these products work? Especially because they, are a slime dunk for reducing N2O emissions, right? Um, right. So, um, and we do have ways to to make them pay, um, and but it's it, it's in a yield advantage. Um, you're going to be hard pressed to 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 get your uh, payback in that, at least for the West from from our research. Others mm -hmm. may 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 find differences. So Ray, and that's I mean that was very much and mario did a lot of this work for you but on one hand common practices in the west already are somewhat you know they're already conserving nitrogen quite a bit but the west doesn't deal with the moisture that we deal with in ontario or the longer season and you're welcome everybody it's way nicer here um anyway you can actually move <laughs> from hey, it's, it's just it's plus, plus two here Lindsay. i don't know what your temperature <laughs> is but um... all right so Fine. I'm going to, I'll back up and answer that, some of that, what I thought was your question, because in my mm -hmm. mind, I just want to hear what I want to hear, not what you're really saying. <laughs> uh, By all means. <laughs> uh, it's all about me. So no, um, this idea, Mario made the comment about we're saving, you know, half a pound, quarter pound, 300 grams. It's not in the yield, it's in the environment. And I get that. From a farmer perspective, it's about, okay, $6 an acre for an EEF. And I'm not getting any yield back, so why should I do that? Fair comment. So in my prior life, we looked at the work and Dale's referenced the ESN and Mario's, I'm sure, done this with the inhibitors and some recent work that Rich Farrell's done. Okay, we can get the same yield with less fertilizer. And maybe while I'm talking, you can pull up slide um, 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 slide slide seven. And so the idea here is from an industry perspective. I can't really, I know from my own work that we can cut our rate by 20% using ESN and get the same yield. But that's a really high risk proposal to give to a farmer to say, hey, you cut your end rate by 20%, pays for the inhibitor, and we're off to the race as we save the world and reduce nitrous oxide. But what happens if something else happens <clears throat> that's not related to the enhanced efficiency fertilizer? The industry is going to get blamed. So what I want to point out with this graphic is that we have the efficiency pro practice and the standard practice. If we move from the standard to the efficiency, we should be able to reduce our rate. And I'll, I'll use the example here. If you if you draw your eyes to the 175 pound rate with the standard practice, and we're getting just a little under 87 and a half 
yield agronomic units. And if you back your finger to the efficiency practice to get the same yield, you're using 88 pounds. This is what the typical work shows with controlled release fertilizer and inhibitors. You can reduce your rate and get the same yield. So you can pay for that enhanced efficiency fertilizer, but the risk from the companies providing these products is very high because they're taking all that risk. We might not be the fertilizer material, it might be the environment. So, mm -hmm. you know, I appreciate what Mario's saying, what Dale's saying, but for the farmer, you know, they, they have to see a monetary reward to using this, whether it's a, it's an offset or whether it's a subsidy or what have you. But I, I on my farm, my family type people, I would be comfortable because of my experience reducing the rate of application to pay for the enhanced efficiency fertilizer. But I can't say that for everybody. Okay, I'm off. Mm. I'm, take the slide so, off. So, so no, the, leave the, it up. <laughs> so the, this is kind of thinking that we're, we're, we're moving to as one of the means for uh, producers to get the payback on the product, which is to reduce the, the, the rate. So w when we do, when I push a pencil looking at the cost, um, it, uh, the cost comes in at about 12 to 10 percent, depending on the product, sometimes a bit more than that of the nitrogen bill uh, in terms of additional. So you'd have to reduce your nitrogen by about 10 to 12 percent to, to, to kind of to break even. OK, and so that's that's what we're advocating. And I think that's that's makes sense to me. Um, and a, a advocating like a 30 percent reduction, I think, is too risky. Too risky. too risky at the moment without having the data for that because in the first year of running the trial yeah you can reduce by 30 i have data where i can reduce nitrogen by 70 percent um, and still get the same yield in the 30 percent versus the 100 percent recommended in that first year in year one but, it, but, yeah. but if yeah but if we, you continue yeah. it down the line then you start seeing because that legacy nitrogen that's in the microbes and through mineralization starts to peter out Mm -hmm. And then now you're hung up. So I'm advocating around the 10 to 12 percent to to get your um, your cost back without jeopardizing um, the sustainability there. Dale. Yes. Yeah. Dale. Dale is waiting so patiently. Oh, hey, Go ahead. All, all good. All good stuff. So so in in my world where you know I'm look this, this is this is the law of diminishing returns. That last pound of N. Uh, you start to lose money on. So this is where I encourage farmers to do some of their own rate trials is to figure out if that last 10 or 20 pounds of nitrogen is actually getting you more yield and what's it costing. And so this is a very real phenomenon. It's just very hard to get there in practical terms with every farmer. But I'm going to bring up the term 4R because that's where I live and it's uh, source rate time and place. And the first thing you got to do is figure out what what's the rate going to be based on historic uh, data, looking at the Ontario Nitrogen Calculator, looking at some research that gets you in a ballpark, considering a split application of nitrogen, maybe 50% up front, leave the second half, adjust by rainfall, you know, yield potential, rainfall drives yield potential, yield potential drives nitrogen demand. So Bill Dean's work showed uh, between V5 and V10, add an extra pound of nitrogen for every millimeter of rainfall. So if you end up with 20 millimeters of rain, you're going to put on 80 for the second split. Then you're putting on 100 because you've got that yield potential built from the late mid-season moisture. So we have lots of tools that we can start to fine tune and then take all your end credits. If you put on 3,000 gallons of hog manure, there's a way to figure that out. If you've got a cover crop that's legume, there's a way to figure that out. So there's lots of things we can do today that really don't cost a lot. We just have to do them. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's pause there for a moment. We're going to hear our last sponsor read, and then I'm going to uh, share Margaret's email with everybody. Uh, so, Producer Jay, if you could, our last read of the night. Tonight's show is brought to you by Adama Canada, Enlist E3 from Corteva, and Acadian Plant Health. Build a strong, high-yielding crop from the ground up. Acadian Plant Health biostimulants improve nutrient use efficiency and build crop resiliency against weather stress at each critical stage of development. For 40 years, Acadian Plant Health has developed biostimulant solutions used on over 100 crops in more than 80 countries worldwide. Find out how at AcadianPlantHealth-NA.com.
All right. So for those of you looking for the knowledge sharing event uh, information, uh, Margaret should be in the chat. She says that she is, uh, but it's mmay at ontariosoilcrop.org. Zip her an email, tell her you watch the show. She'll get the information uh, to you and from you that is needed. So that's mmay at ontariosoilcrop.org um, and if she's in the comments she may link there uh, sometimes it works sometimes it doesn't but there you go and if there are any other questions or if you can't connect with uh, Margaret just zip us an email uh, my email is lsmith at realagriculture.com okay so um, Curtis has got a question but I want to the one clip I pulled uh, was with Brian Barris, talked about some of these products and talked about handling of these products. So I did want to just quickly touch on some of that. Of course, some of these, you know, you're ordering from, uh, you know, you're ordering your treated uh, fertilizer. It comes that way. I know I've talked with one farmer about comparing, um, you know, you're not going to order some treated some not uh, as far as delivery goes. Uh, so how do you make these comparisons? But we've also heard about, you know, if we're talking about polymer coatings, do we need to handle this differently? Do we need to worry about how it was handled before it got to you and about the effectiveness? Ray, I'll start with you first. Should we worry about these things or are we okay, so, not the well, thing in the past? Yep. So, so Brian, we, I was a co-author on that paper and we went through all the handling iterations, different equipment and different abrasions. And we, in the laboratory, abraded to certain percentages and we ran it through equipment. And, you know, the, the coating is very thin. There's no doubt about that. But when I was working on it back in the 2000s, it was, you had the load out of the plant, the load into the retail, across the retail bin system, through the, through the, through the blender, out into a truck, truck to farm, truck auger to farm bin, mm -hmm. out of farm bin to field. Mm -hmm. So seven to 11 handlings, it was the coating thick enough for that. Where you run into trouble is if one retail moves it to another retail, or mm -hmm. there's a couple of movements on the farm that we're not counting on in the dead of winter. Otherwise, and there's been some other work Carl Rosen did at University of Minnesota on uh, you know, air booms and things of that nature. It's kind of the, the exception rather than the rule. Uh, and Lindsay, if I gave somebody a pail of product from the cars and fertilizer plant south of Calgary and they put it out there, they would be very disappointed that it would be way too slow. So it mm. needs some handling, some abrasion. And, and Mario's been through this and we do all that kind of work. Mm -hmm. That's a good point. All right. Now I, I want to talk about Curtis's point here. So uh, interesting comment on feeding the soil with nitrogen and then it starts to peter out, right? So we, you're right. If we don't apply nitrogen and Dale, some of your work with the Delta N looking at, you know, what, what does the soil itself provide? Um, that's yeah. often what we're trying to gauge in Ontario. Um, the longer term impact of using, of reducing nitrogen rates with enhanced efficiency fertilizers. Mario, you are doing some long-term work not necessarily looking at that but if we think about if over time we're adding less nitrogen do we worry about the longevity of the soil's ability to mineralize longer term uh, we certainly see that here in ontario where we pull that nitrate test and some years goodness that soil provides and it provides a lot uh, <coughs> is that a concern mario yes so what do we do about it I love that. So what are we? So then, well, the you, 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 you we use use the use the four R's, um, uh, set that rate appropriately, um, and uh, uh, as Dale said, I love it. On farm, on farm trials, strip trials, uh, delta yield, however you want to do it. You can, if you can, sacrifice little. What we ask our growers is to put little, little chunks um in strips that are little blocks that are no fertilizer and then zero. um yeah. so we got a zero in there as well and uh, we're putting in strips with growers that are 10 percent reduction in nitrogen and uh, with um, the nitrification inhibitors um or, or esn and um that that's the approach now what happens is let's put it this way in the prairies you, you add nitrogen, let's say I add 100 pounds of nitrogen. You know, we do our study and we calculate that, uh, oh, nitrogen ended up in the grain. 
you know, and then some people have the gall to say that's, you know, we're only 40% efficient in our nitrogen uptake. Well, that's a bunch of BS, right? Because um, right. that's only in the grain removal, but the plant took up nitrogen, right? And so if you calculate the total, the total nitrogen removal of the, of the plant and then even tag on the, the, the roots, we're, we're higher. We're like, we, sometimes we're 70 to 90 percent, depending on the year, even up to 100 um, percent. But that nitrogen now is going, a lot of that's going back into the ground with the residues as the roots mm -hmm. die. And then uh, some of it is uh, also um, immobilized and taken up by the microbes. Right. That is going to be yeah. nitrogen mineralized the following year. So um, I don't buy this in the prairies that we're, we're, we have very poor nitrogen efficient systems because that mineralization that's coming out next year is fertilizer. Mm -hmm. It's the previous year's fertilizer. So if we um, start dropping the nitrogen applications, what you're doing is you're reducing that reservoir that's been immobilized of the nitrogen in the fertilizer and mm -hmm. it the, the following year you have less provided and as you go five ten years what you're actually having in terms of mineralization is really what the microbes have stored recently and if you starve them they have very little to give up so it, it it's 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 a no-win situation so we're not going to go around reducing our nitrogen rates by 30% to meet the nitrous oxide emissions. And nobody ever said that was the case. Right. Um, okay. right? So we're not, we're not going there. Right. Um, so, and go, okay, go ahead. That's enough. Yeah. Mary, if I could. Okay. So actually I've got, I think it's Ray, I think it's your slide number nine, but I'm going to go to Dale on this question because go, exactly go, that. Go, go to slide eight and nine. Is it eight, eight nine? First, okay, good. I, eight, eight, I wrote eight, down nine, nine yeah. but Dale, I'll go to you because this is, you mentioned, and Mario and Ray, you should be ashamed of yourselves. Dale's the only one who mentioned manure. But uh, the, <laughs> this, but the, the point of addition to the soil, right? We don't get something from nothing. The All soil you need to do is, is look at the second sentence. Some might be cycling and now flip to your slide nine because there you, you, were, you, were, you were studying, you did your pre-work homework. I did. Thank you. And right, so the immobilization of 10 to 40 percent that we talked about. There we about. go. 30 so, is a common walking around number on the prairies. If you don't yeah. have that, you've got nothing in the future. Now I'll shut up. <laughs> so, all right. So Dale, now that Rhea shut up. No, just kidding. Um, <laughs> This it's a really good point, right? So some nitrogen gets lost, yes, lost to the atmosphere, whatever. But the nitrogen is a cycle, right? So um, we're going to have some immobilized. We're going to have some that's in crop residues. We're going to have some in those root systems. Dale, you mentioned and you know outlining all the ways that you're going to be adding up what is adding to the nutrient bank for our crops. So clearly, if we're reducing our nitrogen applications because we're perhaps more efficient with it, it doesn't mean that that reduction continues and continues and continues because at some point you still have to feed for the yield potential. All right. So, so the practical thing we see is in a corn soybean root rotation. So after soybeans, you get about a 30 pound end credit. And it's not because they're a legume and they fixed nitrogen. It's because there's no residue penalty. Right? We have hardly any residue after soybeans, so there's no immobilization after soybeans to speak of. But after corn, we have to add corn on corn, you get roughly another 25 to 30 pounds additional N being recommended because of the immobilization aspect of the heavy residue there. So now, and those are very, we see those are very real things. Farmers tend, tend to understand that. So, yeah, it's, and the other thing too, you know, we talk about <clears throat> soil health and cover crops. We're building that mineralizable nitrogen pool when we add any kind of, uh, of uh, residue or, or, uh, or, you know, biomass residue from either biosolids or, or, or manure. So, so we got ways to keep building that mineralizable nitrogen from the organic standpoint. So, you know, we just, we just see this, we see the farms that have uh, complex rotations and they do residue management and they, they use manure when they got it or biosolids. So, we, we see that in the soil, we, you know, the crop resilient, the yield is more consistent. We have more yield stability when, when we do those kinds of things. So it, it's uh, pretty easy to see. And, and uh, those are kind of the fun fields to work on. Fun. That's right. Fun. No. So, but, but to that point is when we get ideal growing conditions, 
should those ever happen, which sometimes they do. And Dale, here in Ontario, we saw some phenomenal yields yep. off fields that, you know, were above and beyond what we may be fertilized for. Where did that come from? It came from the soil, what was already there, though. It, it was put there at some point. Well, I'm of the vintage of Ray, so my math says organic matter contains nitrogen. So the time you do the calculation on 60,000 pounds organic matter, you come up with 5,000 pounds mineralized nitrogen of two to three per, or two to five percent that becomes available in any given year. So 60 to 300 pounds. So if you got really good, warm, moist soil conditions and the bugs are really active, you might get an extra 200 pounds of nitrogen over and above what you put on. And uh, you've got some phenomenal corn yields. You also might have some carryover. Right. So uh, that those are the things that, that we see. So whenever you get a year, even like this one, where we got more yield, we fertilized for a 200 bushel yield goal and harvest of 280. Well, mm -hmm. it didn't come out of thin air. There was nitrogen there. It had to be right. So, yeah. Uh, so we see that stuff. Yeah. So it does, mm -hmm. it does come from the, from the organic pool, the soil, the mineralizable in the soil, in the soil. Right. And means that we're going to have to replace for that too. Well, if, if I said this complex rotation of, of corn, soybeans, winter wheat, well, I don't know how many more years of research we need from Dr. Dave Hooker to say wheat's good for, good for the other two crops. I mean, any time that you're uh, reducing tillage, you know, the nice part about winter wheat, you're not doing any tillage for 11 months of the year, basically. So you're not messing up the soil. That's the nice part about winter wheat. You're not disturbing the soil and you get better soil structure. So it's all those things that come together to give you some some uh, really good growing conditions. So I'm having a, a cough attack here, which I've managed to avoid all evening. So <laughs> we'll try to hold it together for these last few minutes. Um, Mario, I'll give you the last word on the research part. What are you working on that we should know about? Oh, um, what are we working? We continue to work in on placement as uh, a means to um, uh, protect uh, losses and um, um, decrease nitrous oxide. We're also doing what we refer to as precision 4R. I'm trying to coin this word, patent it, precision 4R, which means you use the, a particular enhanced efficiency product in a field in the positions or the places in the field that need it. So we're taking advantage of um, multiple boxes uh, and bins uh, on um, on cedars planters to um, choose urea in the, the dryer or the, the crests or knolls and then put in a nitrification inhibitor or an ESN product in the depression areas which are more prone to loss. This is all um, done with um, um, a variable rate nitrogen and then also what I'm referring to as variable source nitrogen and it's all GPS and um, so forth. So that's that's really what I'm really super, super excited about. I like it. It sounds very complicated. We're, do, um, we're doing that on Adam Adam Gurr's uh, land oh, just north oh. of Brandon around Forest. And then uh, okay. next year, uh, U of S and uh, Indian Head IHARF are uh, joining us in that project. And we have, uh, I have I, I, I keep getting emails from people saying, we want to be a project site. <laughs> How can we Good. do that? So, Goodness. And we're working with Crop Pro as well. Okay. Has that, is that a common thing that you get emails saying, hey, we'd love to host this trial too? Or do you usually have to beg? Um, no, I, I, I get a lot of, uh, e I wouldn't say a lot. <laughs> I okay. get a few emails <laughs> every year saying, hey, I uh, heard you speak. If uh, if you're interested uh, um, coming by our, our need soils in our wake, uh, consider uh, our farm. Yeah, yeah. We, All right. we, we get those kind of invitations. Okay, I like it. And uh, Dale, you did mention, of course, at the top uh, that you've got, you will, I hope, share those findings with, with us when you have them. Sure. Yep. We'll look forward to those. Thank you. Yep. Um, Ray, I'm going to give you the last question. Let's see if you can answer it. Speaking of forms of nitrogen, what is the percent contribution of ammonium and nitrate to canola and wheat with regards I'll, to uptake? I'll, I'll Do we and, know I'll the answer? Try and be, I'll try and be relatively brief. In the prairies okay. where we are, most of our nitrogen ends up being nitrate. But there is going to be a portion of nitrogen taken up as ammonium early in the season. Plants can take up early. urea 
they can take up ammonium, they can take up nitrate, but in our environment, it's primarily nitrate. If you want to geek out, John Lation, he used to be with Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada and Swift Current, did a bunch of work on wheat in Saskatchewan, okay. and he came up with similar ideas that we see with corn in the U.S. We talk about enhanced ammonium nitrogen synthesis, that there is a blend between ammonium and nitrate that is ideal for every crop, but it depends on the environment. And um, it's, I, I don't have the appropriate answer, but most of our nitrogen is going to be nitrate. A small amount okay. is ammonium. It sounds to me like it would be very complicated to create the perfect mix of ammonium and nitrate. So let's just focus on the general. Okay. Um, maybe I'm wrong. I'll go geek out about it, right? I'll go dig into it and see. You, you All right. You search on enhanced ammonium synthesis with corn and you'll get a whole bunch of research papers okay. that will give you this. See? Yeah, and oh, as Tammy, 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 yeah. Tammy, Tammy, how many times did I have to say your name? Tammy, I yeah. expect it's situationally specific. Oh, wait, he didn't. He did say it depends. Damn it, it depends. she caught me. She caught, she caught you. Me. She caught me. And <laughs> Jason votes as ammonium equals milk and nitrate equals whiskey. Oh, goodness. Things have really, after 9 p.m., things go off the rails on the show. All right. <laughs> uh, thank you to each of you for joining me tonight. Um, Mario, Ray, Dale, I appreciate it so much. Thank you for sharing your time and your Most experience. welcome, and thanks to the guys, and thanks to the audience. This was, was yeah. enjoyable. And learning, yes. and learning, a learning event, a learning event. Right. Yeah, lots, of, knowledge... lots of fun with you guys. Yeah, appreciate it. Yeah. A, a Thanks, guys. Event. Thanks, Lindsay. Yes. So make sure if anyone needs uh, that KSE uh, credit, you can email me, lsmith at realagriculture.com. I'll connect you. Next week, we're going to be talking tile drainage. So uh, if you're curious or in Ontario and want to talk water management, uh, check us out next week, 8 p.m. Eastern. I'm going to feel a lot better by then. Thank you to each of you. Thank you to our show sponsors, uh, Acadian Plant Health, Enlist E3 Soybeans, and of course, Adama Canada. Until next week, cheers, everyone. Cheers.